this uh, talks on forest herbicides. Uh, just talk a little bit about uh, common herbicides and uh, the different application methods that can be used. Um, and I'm Paul Bain, District Forester uh, in Illinois. So uh, I guess I started off the presentation with uh, a reason to use herbicides. Uh, a lot of people have, a, have an issue in common uh, uh, with, with invasive species. Now, this is a picture of bush honeysuckle. Uh, it kind of it shades out the, uh, the forest floor, and as you can see, nothing on the forest floor is growing. So this, this can be an issue when worrying about regeneration. Um, this is a picture of uh, garlic mustard infestation, another common one, at least uh, here in northwest Illinois. Um, this uh, garlic mustard actually has uh, uh, what are called allelopathic chemicals that can uh, inhibit the growth of other, other, uh, 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 other vegetation. So it definitely spreads quickly. Uh, <clears throat> Multi-floor rose here. I mean, this this is a, and it's just a pain. That everybody's who walked through their woods and has has it knows. I mean, you don't you don't forget about multi-floor rose. There, you'll be cut up, and so your all of your clothes when you get out of the woods. Uh, Japanese barberry. It's kind of a tough picture to see, um, but in my opinion, I think that's going to be the next explosion of invasive species that's going to be coming, at least to northwest Illinois. I'm seeing it more and more often, um, even within the last five or six years. Uh, autumn olive, I think everybody, you know, it's kind of got silvery leaves. Uh, it's a, uh, another exotic in buckthorn, which is a big problem in northeast Illinois. Uh, so when combining, combating unwanted vegetation, there are several different uh, ways to go about it. Uh, the easiest, which I kind of talked about in my last talk, is prevention, uh, scouting your forest, knowing what's there. You start to see invasives, um, be, the, and this is before you consider um, using chemicals. If you if you find it early enough, you can just pull it, um, which you know that's or well or mechanical control. Uh, you can mow or cut the uh, the species. What's what that does? Uh, kind of decimates the the seed in the uh, seed bank. Uh, hopefully, you know you can you can set things back by mowing or cutting them. Um, a manual, which, like as I mentioned, pulling garlic mustard, or uh, when the the ground is soft, you can pull uh, other invasives such as honeysuckle. Um, they, they don't have the deep tap root; they kind of their roots spread, so they're easier to pull, especially in the spring. Uh, biological control, um, which is an introduction of natural predators, whether it be fungus. Or uh, an example is a purple loose strife. Uh, there was a beetles were released um, to combat the purple loose strife. When they went through, they ate entire populations, uh, well, majority of populations, and the uh, subsequently uh, they there were small pockets left. Which uh, what happened is they did what invasives do, and they they uh, they started to spread again. So um, they had to come back and use chemical chemical control afterwards. Um, there's cultural uh, combating, which is <clears throat> revegetating. So rather than fighting, uh, well, whenever you take, take uh, control of the invasives, you can put back in some natives to help outcompete some of that uh, invasive vegetation. And then what this is about is the, the chemical use, uh, so using herbicides to combat some of the, your unwanted vegetation. So reasons you use herbicides is uh, uh, you're usually having vegetation interfere with your desired regeneration. That's an issue that uh, uh, most people have when they decide to use herbicides. Um, so that's due to the increased invasive species infestation, like I mentioned, but also um, native vegetation. So shade tolerant species um, that are lesser desired, um, you may want to use herbicide to help deal with those. And what I have here is poor harvesting practices. So if you look at this uh, this picture, uh, you can see the the overstories or the, the forest floor is shaded out, and what's come back is a lot of it's tough to see, but a lot of maple. So if you took out these these dominant trees, what's going to come back is the maples, which in some instances are are lesser desired. <clears throat> so why they're useful? 
uh, herbicides will reduce competition. Uh, they aid in regeneration by opening up the forest floor, uh, killing that, that mat that's there. Um, can enhance wildlife habitat, uh, control your non-native plants. Uh, it can definitely help with the ease of maintenance of forest roads and trails. Um, doing some uh, uh, spraying while you're going through is a lot easier than going through and with a chainsaw and clearing. You know, rather than doing 100 feet or, or 500 feet in a day, you can do long distances, and they're they're pretty cost effective, and uh, they're it's a lot easier to labor. So uh, there's two different uh, uh, herbicide formulations: uh, amine, which is a water-based herbicide. You generally want to mix with water. Uh, ester is an oil-based herbicide, <clears throat> which you mix mix with a uh, basil oil, kerosene, diesel. Uh, fuel, oil, anything, anything really. Um, but uh, if you do mix on accident oil-based herbicides with uh, water, you, you'll be able to tell immediately. Kind of gunks up, gets like thick, thick paint. Um, application techniques: uh, There's foliar application, uh, doing a backpack sprayer or a boom sprayer. There's a cut stump application, uh, frill girdle or other stem injections. Uh, there's basal bark treatments, and then aerial spraying as well. So when doing a, a foliar-based application, you're going to want to use amine uh, herbicides, water-based herbicides. Uh, first thing I'll always say is, you know, read, uh, understand, and follow the herbicide labels. If you don't understand, there'll be numbers that you can you can call or local extension or myself. You can get a hold of somebody, uh, ask as many questions as you need before for uh, mixing herbicides or dealing with herbicides at all. Um, so with a lot of these uh, foliar applications, you're going to want to mix a uh, recommended surfactant. What surfactant does is it helps the, the herbicide stick to the leaves. So it, it, it's a binding agent. Uh, if you just spray water on leaves, a lot of times you'll see it beat up and fall off. And what it's trying to do is get the water to the roots. Uh, but the surfactants help that herbicide stick. Um, you're going to want to use uh, minimum spray, sprayer pressure control, uh, or pressures to control drift. Uh, drift is uh, in the news a lot. Uh, you don't want to, you want to kill your target species and not kill uh, the vegetation that you're trying to save. Uh, mix with clean water. A lot of the, these sprayer parts are really fine. If you get uh, some soil or some sand into these sprayers, they will malfunction and, and, it, and it'll take a lot of time to clean them out. Um, the addition of dyes uh, to assure that you coverage. I like to do that a lot because you know a lot of times you, you get turned around, you're not sure if you sprayed something or, or, or not, but using dyes you can easily see uh, if, if a plant is blue or if it's green. So um, <clears throat> uh, The treatment is applicable uh, for target stems less than six feet. When you get too much bigger than that, it's tough to spray. Uh, not only, I mean, if, you, if you're holding the wand way up here with a backpack sprayer, you're going to end up getting it all over yourself, uh, spraying non-targets. Um, you're going to want to, they, they suggest to completely wet the foliage, but you want to get at least 50% of the foliage, if not more. So spray as much of the plant as you can. It doesn't need to be dripping off. You just want to make sure that you, you hit it. And you're going to want to apply during rain-free periods. Different herbicides do have uh, different rain fast periods, um, but generally speaking, you don't want it to rain for a while after you spray. So by a while, I mean a, uh, 24 hours, ideally. Uh, <clears throat> the best results are uh, before the, the, you don't want to spray fully herbicides when the plants are dormant, but in the late summer while the foliage is still green, it's a good time. Uh, if the right after a plant uh, flowers, it's a good time. They've used a lot of resources up. Um, but if the seed, or if the plant has already gone to seed, and you spray it with herbicide, that seed will still be viable. Uh, it won't, won't won't abort that seed, so it's too late for that year. But you still can kill that parent plant. So here's a couple examples of foliar applications. Uh, this is likely a a uh, pump sprayer off of a, a uh, back of an ATV or, or a vehicle. It's kind of a broadcast spray. Uh, here's a a backpack blower. So it's a, a mister. What they're doing is, once again, you can see a lot of this uh, honeysuckle in the background. 
you know, you can cover a lot of area with that thing. <clears throat> Here's a, uh, a boomless sprayer. So this is likely for uh, tree planting uh, or, or, you know, just killing a large area. Maybe this, maybe there was an area with reed canary grass. You can use use a, a unit like that. And then here's a backpack sprayer. I think unless he's really short, that's probably over six feet. But he did he did does have blue in there though, so at least he can tell what he hit and what he did. And that that honeysuckle is in bloom as well. So a couple concerns with uh, foliar application. Uh, you, you can't once again you can't can't spray uh, foliar. Uh, herbicide when a plant is dormant. So if the if they're no longer, uh, if this also happens in in long periods of drought. Uh, if 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 we haven't had rain for a long time, those plants will stop intaking uh, nutrients, so they, it won't kill them. Uh, a lot of times they'll get kind of a waxy cuticle on the leaves, and they they just don't take in the herbicide. Um, <clears throat> you want to make sure that you get good foliar coverage. So. Like I said, spray as much of the leaves as you can. Uh, use surfactants. Uh, make sure that uh, uh, that that water, or excuse me, the herbicide is binding to those leaves. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a different weather, so uh, don't want to spray it when it, when there might be rain, uh, or if it's if it's too hot, there may be what's called volatility, meaning that uh, herbicides such as 2,4-D are volatized easily. Um, they will uh, evaporate into the air and be, can be carried long distances. So you want to make sure that, uh, once again, that will be in the herbicide label. Uh, make sure that you, you're applying the herbicide within its, its intended use. And then overspray, want to kill your, once again, kill your desired, uh, the plant that you're actually trying to kill. Um, and then you want to take into consideration uh, your proximity to other water sources. If you're spraying next to a stream, or another water source. Uh, there is uh, aquatic usage herbicides that can be used as opposed to run-of-the-mill um, uh, glyphosate herbicides. Well, there is glyphosate herbicides that are approved for use around water as well. So here are the uh, some uh, just a few examples of herbicides. Uh, Imazepur, which is kind of like Arsenal. Um, there's several others. This would be if you're killing kind of that, that picture that I showed. Uh, it's got extra, excellent control of maples. It's a non-ionic uh, surfactant is required. So those surfactants, you know, they are, mo well, you want to make sure you get a non-ionic. Uh, I sometimes use dish soap as a surfactant. Um, it, it doesn't work as well as some other surfactants, but um, it, if you pay attention to the, how your, your herbicide is reacting to the leaves, You'll be able to tell if it's if it's beaten up and running off. That's not what you want. You want it to stick. Um, and if you have dye, you can kind of you can really tell if that dye's sticking or if it's just rolling off. Uh, glyphosate. Uh, there's several of those. Uh, Roundup, Crop Smart, um, a litany of others. Um, I use personally like to use uh, uh, Crop Smart. I can get it at my my local store and it's uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, <clears throat> whenever you use it as a foliar application, uh, you're going to cover as much of the foliage as possible. Um, if you are doing a cut and treat method, uh, you want to do it, you want to apply it immediately. Um, re retreatment is, is commonly required, so it's tough to, to kill it all in one go. But glyphosate's kind of a, a catch-all. It's a non-selective herbicide that'll That'll get get pretty much everything. Uh, Triclopyr with uh, 2,4-D, which is like a crossbow. You no, know, I've used that quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> it's control of various herbaceous wood and woody species. Uh, contains a 2,4-D ester, and uh, once again, that volatility and drift is a consideration that you have to you have to uh, take into account. Um, and then there's a triclopyr ester. Uh, which is uh, kind of like a Garlon 3 or sometimes called Element 3. There's, there's a bunch of those uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> next application method, a cut stop treatment. You can use both uh, amine and ester formulations. Once again, is the, the uh, rule to, 
read, understand, and follow the herbicide labels. Um, <clears throat> you can use the amine, which is the water-based herbicide, if it's above freezing. And that's, you can even use it down to, to 24 degrees, 25 degrees, uh, as long as the, the herbicide isn't freezing in your, uh, in your what, whether you're using a backpack sprayer or a hand sprayer, uh, as long as it's, it's properly uh, um, uh, functioning, then you'll, it'll still work. Um, ester herbicides, if it's below freezing, so once again, that's water versus oil-based herbicides. Um, <clears throat> you always want to treat the stumps immediately after you cut them. Um, it's, uh, if, you let, if you cut a stump and, and let it sit for a while, a lot of times it'll, it'll start pushing up sap and, and, you, and the herbicide won't be effective. Uh, treatment is effective on all sizes of stumps. Um, <clears throat> uh, generally speaking, you just spray the, the living portion, uh, the cambium layer of the, of the stump, and that'll, that'll be sufficient to kill it. So you don't have to waste it by on a big stump covering the entire thing. Just cover that outer sapwood. And treatment is uh, best applied June 1st to November 1st. So it's kind of after the, the plant has, uh, it has leafed out and it's no longer pushing up. Uh, as trees start to, um, start to become dormant, they're, they're sucking, taking nutrients from the canopy down. So if you spray herbicide on that, that living portion, the, that herbicide will be pushed down into its roots. And, and be effective. And then once again, I guess, don't uh, uh, apply during heavy sap, sap flow. Here's a cut, cut stump application. Uh, you can see here just the, the outer layer of this, the, the living portion of this plant. This is, this is uh, heartwood. It's not living, so you don't, there's no need to apply the herbicide in there. Uh, here's uh, somebody who's tried to use even less herbicide, so what they're doing is they sprayed the herbicide on the paintbrush and just painted the stump. And that was likely an uh, uh, oil-based herbicide here. Uh, there's, I, I call this the hockey stick, but uh, what it is is you, at the top, top of this hockey stick, there's a, uh, a cap to this PVC pipe, and herbicide is in here, and this, this nozzle is just slightly open, and what it does is just wets this wick, and you can apply that directly to the stump. And here's essentially the same, the same uh, tool, just slightly different. Some concerns, uh, weather. Uh, you don't want it to rain on your stumps right after you applied herbicide. It could wash it off. Uh, the time of year, once again, if you have that heavy sap flow, it won't be effective. It'll just be pushed out. Um, and then flashback potential. Uh, Picloram, which is the active ingredient in uh, Tordon, is uh, it can, well, in this area, a big concern is when, in areas with a lot of walnuts, it can go through, or go into the roots and then affect the trees next to it and kill those as well. So when you're trying to help out, you maybe do a crop to release for one of the, for a walnut, you could actually end up killing it. So that's not a, you need to be aware when using kind of those, those uh, I guess, nastier chemicals. Uh, glyphosate is kind of a, uh, uh, once again, a Roundup, uh, Roundup type herbicide. <clears throat> and I guess uh, glyphosate, I should have mentioned this, but it is a, uh, in, with cut stump treatments, it's used at a much higher uh, uh, concentration than it is with foliar applications. Now, once again, follow the labels, but, uh, but generally speaking, it's uh, 2 to 6% for a foliar application uh, versus a uh, cut stump application would be around 50% um, concentration mixed with, mixed with water. So here's some, uh, a couple herbicides <clears throat> that are uh, uh, used with a cut stump treatment. Um, uh, once again, the Arsenal or Stalker. Um, as well, well as uh, Triclopyr, an example is the Garlon 3A, Element 3A. Um, there's a lot of different names for these, these herbicides, but they do contain the same active ingredients. Um, I guess uh, one I didn't talk about is Milestone. Uh, 
you can use that for cut stump treatment. And it's kind of the same. You want to apply it immediately after cutting. So stem injection, there's, there's several different uh, stem injection uh, or ways to do stem injection. Uh, one of which is the hack and squirt method um, using amine-based herbicides. Um, you can make an, one incision per inch of diameter uh, at DBH. So if you have a six inch tree, you have one, uh, or you would make six uh, incisions onto that tree. Um, uh, it's applicable to stems that are uh, greater than an inch in DBH. And then once again, like with the cut stump method, uh, you don't want to, to apply it during heavy sap flow. There's a couple of pictures of hack and squirt method. Um, this is a, a hydro axe, which herbicide, you carry this with you, and uh, it's got a tube that leads to this, this uh, uh, axe has a kind of a nozzle here at the end, and it applies the herbicide as you, as you dig into the tree. And this is just a regular axe uh, that's making an incision, and then he's got a, a water bottle, but he's got his gloves on too. So the hack and squirt method, <clears throat> there's a uh, arsenal. Um, you can, and these are, once again, make sure you read it, read the labels of all these. It's tough to kind of do a, a catch all with the herbicides because they are all different. Uh, you, different you're going to use different concentrations, different, uh, um, different application methods. But uh, glyphosate, once again, kind of, kind of seems to get everything. So another stem injection is to girdle trees. Um, the, you could either, if you double girdle trees, uh, they're less likely. You, you might not even have to use herbicide. They're less likely to re-sprout. But what I do personally is double girdle, and then I treat the, the bottom girdle. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody, just quickly, uh, girdling a tree is just to take a chainsaw and ring the tree, connect it. And what you're doing is... is uh, cutting off that vascular system of the tree so it can't exchange nutrients up and down. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I guess I said that. Uh, you're going to spray the herbicide, the bottom herbicide ring, or spray the bottom ring with herbicide. Uh, treatment's effective on all sizes of stumps, uh, all sizes of trees. Best apply June 1st to November 1st. Uh, once again, don't apply during heavy sap flow. So here's kind of an example of girdling. Um, this is uh, this is pretty. It's, it's it's fairly deep, but I mean, I guess the rule of thumb is, if when you're girdling a tree, you want to be able to see daylight through the tree when looking if you get down on the same level as the girdle. Um, here's a double girdled tree. Uh, looks like you know this is pretty low to the ground. Uh, it's tough to do all of the trees like that, but. But, you know, they're completely cut around, and then uh, uh, you would really only need to apply herbicide to the, the bottom uh, girdle. So girdling the trees, you know, you can, once again, you can use uh, a bunch of different herbicides, but Garlon 3A, which is an amine herbicide, which is water-based, um, you, you want to apply enough of the spray to completely wet the cut surface. Uh, Tricopur, which is an ester oil-based once again, uh, Garlon 4, Element 4. Um, there's uh, there's a lot you know a lot of those. Uh, glyphosate, which once again is your Roundup Crop Smart. Um, you're going to want to apply enough to uh, enough of the spray to completely wet the surface again. And then Milestone's good for that as well. There's also what's called the Easy Jack system, um, which I've personally used. I, I think this is uh, very useful in Kind of uh, uh, in planting areas or uh, or in a yard, uh, it's tough to use when you're kind of going up and down hills or there's a lot of vegetation around. Um, uh, I guess I should show you what it is. It's a it's a long lance that has a spring-loaded um, tip, and it's also got two grips on the uh, on the lance. And uh, what happens is that you you load this lance with uh, capsules that kind of look like 22 uh, uh, shells, and they they have herbicide in here. You can load them, load up this lance with them, and just press them into the 
into the uh, the bark of the tree, and what'll happen is as things uh, heat up and cool down, this herbicide slowly released into the into the tree and kill on it. But anyways, it's uh, once again you're going to want to read and follow the herbicide labels. Um, <clears throat> they I've seen glyphosate in the Mazepur capsules. Um, they they have directions with the with the lances uh, if you were to purchase one, but they say to inject uh, one capsule every four inches. Uh, it's best applied from June 1st to November 1st. Um, and then the nice thing I think about it is you can apply this in all weather. I mean, if it's raining, it's okay, and, and as long as you're not slipping around, you can still treat the treat treat the plants. So once again, here's a picture of it. Some some concerns are the the time of year. Uh, during heavy sap flow, it's going to be a little bit less in, ineffective. Um, you want to you don't want it to be raining immediately after uh, you treat treat the uh, the plants. Um, different species, like I said, with some some herbicides such as Tordon, uh, some of those those uh, less hardy trees uh, like walnut might uh, might have some sort of flashback potential, and and you may end up killing your non-target trees. Um, last thing I think I'm going to talk about, well, it's second to last, uh, is a basal bark application. Um, once again, uh, but anyways, you, you spray completely around a, a stem 12 to 15 inches above the ground line. So a lot of times with a backpack sprayer, that's easily reached. Um, you What you do is you treat, treat the stem, you spray an oil-based herbicide, uh, uh, so an ester, ba an ester herbicide, um, uh, completely around the tree. And what I do is, if the, if there's a 12-inch tree, I want to make sure that my my herbicide band is 12 inches long. So uh, get a foot-long tree, uh, and it's applicable to uh, trees, you know, six to uh, or over or less than or should be over six inches, and uh, uh, treatment you don't want to treat over a thousand stems per acre. Um, you're going to want to, like I said, apply at a rate equal to the DBH, and apply any time of the year uh, as long as the stems are dry. Uh, you don't want if the stems wet, you know, it could wick away some of that herbicide. Here's an example of a basal basal bark application. Uh, they went all the way around the tree. Uh, the, you can see, and, and also what's nice about basil bark is if you were to walk o around your woods and you came back, this tree, you're going to still be able to tell that it was treated. Uh, this is this is called a Birchmeyer pack. <clears throat> this is uh, what I use to uh, um, to spray oil. Uh, it's, it gets difficult if you're using, uh, say, a solo pack or another foliar uh, uh, application uh, backpack, and you're using and you're mixing going between water and oil because like I mentioned if those mix you're gonna get you're gonna get kind of a milky um, thick uh, it, it, it kind of makes the sprayer malfunction uh, these Birchmeyer packs um, they say that you should clean them out and I've I've never cleaned mine out it's uh, I mean it I use the same herbicide in it but that oil lubricant I mean it, it the parts don't go bad it's got a lot of brass tips. Um, they are a little bit expensive, um, but but they're uh, I think they're worth it, especially if you're going to be doing a lot of basal bark application. A uh, Birchmeyer pack, B I R C H M E Y E R, I think. So some uh, herbicides uh, to use for basal bark. Once again, these are all oil-based herbicides. They're going to be mixed. With a uh, uh, unless they, they come ready to use, they're going to be mixed with a basal bark oil, uh, diesel, um, something along those lines. Best for trees less than four inches in DBH. Um, I for uh, stalker um, Pathfinder comes as a ready to use product. Uh, it, so like I said, you wouldn't need to mix that one. Torridon's the same thing. I mean, it comes ready to use. Um, and then there's also a uh, triclopyr, which is a uh, uh, be like a Garlon 4, Remedy, Ultra. Uh, there's several others.
some concerns are the weather. Once again, you want to make sure that the, the bark is dry. Um, it's not going to be washed off immediately after you, after you apply it. Uh, any flashback potential. So with uh, Picloram, and so that's the Tordon and the Mazapur, it'd be, uh, uh, you need to worry about the neighboring trees. You want to only hurt the target trees. Um, it does work best with thinly bark trees. You know, cotton, I've seen it work with cottonwood, uh, but cottonwoods are pretty hardy as well, so uh, results can be mixed. <clears throat> and then it can be used during the growing or dormant season. So if you wanted to go out and, and uh, uh, do some treatment during, during the summer, uh, this is a good, good uh, application method. Last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, aerial spraying. So aerial spraying is uh, f using a foliar uh, applied herbicide over a large area. So it's generally used for uh, high density invasives uh, if you, or if you're going to do a site, uh, use, do site preparation for a tree planting or if there was a clear cut harvest that came back and, and or, or you're going to subsequently plant, you can go through and and do a, uh, an aerial application. Um, it's primarily for larger areas, uh, 10 plus acres, and that's just because um, if you're going to try to contract a, a guy that has a has a helicopter or a plane, uh, they they want to make it worth their while. Uh, maybe you're next door from them or somebody that's in close proximity, and they would do smaller acreages. Um, but I mean, 10 acres is pretty. Uh, it's not a very big acreage to be doing some aerial uh, spraying. Uh, the nice thing about this is it's, it's definitely the least labor intensive uh, uh, application that you can have. I mean, they, they'll fly over and, and, and it's, they, they come back to uh, put herbicide back in the, in the, in the helicopter and they, it takes about five minutes for them to uh, um, load back up and then they, they're off again. So it's, it's extremely inexpensive. Um, I think there was an aerial application that was done in Joe Davis County that, that came out to be about 65 bucks an acre for uh, extremely dense honeysuckle. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, you can definitely cover uh, a large area in a short amount of time. So the, I mean, one thing that you definitely have to be, well, here's a few pictures of, of kind of a, aerial helicopter spraying, uh, and then here's a, a plane. Uh, helicopters, in my uh, my opinion, are, are they hit the target uh, better than than uh, aerial or than a, than a plane, and they also there's less drift. So some concerns are uh, overspray. Um, it, it's it's kind of uh, a, an e you know a necessary evil if you you're going to have overspray no matter what. Um, you, you may have unintended consequences, uh, such as, <clears throat> you know, if there's a, a fern that's still, so when you apply the herbicide, it's going to be after the oaks have dropped their leaves, uh, so that the herbicide can reach the, the forest floor to get to the, the exotics. And, uh, some native vegetation may still be green, so there may be some unintended consequences. Um, not only that, but, but, you know, your neighbors, May have some overspray. Uh, if you're if you're considering aerial treatment, I would suggest that you talk to your neighbors. You kind of uh, it'd be cheaper for everybody if you kind of got your neighbors on board with it as well. They say that they want to take care of their their property too. Uh, the timing. So you want the you don't want the uh, invasives to be dormant yet. So uh, say fall, you have about a week to two week uh, window between. When the leaves, the oak leaves have fallen off, and the uh, the honeysuckle is still, or or whatever invasive is still is still alive. Um, <clears throat> another thing about uh, uh, timing is is at the same time a lot of you know the the sprayers, uh, the people with planes, they don't have uh, much work, so they're looking for they're looking for uh, other areas to spray. So you want to make sure that you uh, understand your, uh, this is, I guess, all-encompassing, but uh, understand what you're wanting to kill. Uh, different herbicides uh, are selective or non-selective. 
uh, herbicides. So make sure you read that label. Um, they have a within a label they have a list of uh, plants that will that will be affected by that that particular herbicide. Um, you want to make sure that you're you're using the herbicide at the right time of year. Uh, the last thing you want to do is go back and have to do several retreatments because your your initial was ineffective. Um, and then you want to decide uh, uh, what control method you're going to use, um, if, whether that is going to be herbicide usage or or you used a, a manual or a, a hand pulling, uh, a different uh, uh, different uh, method of, of of killing what you're wanting to get rid of. Um, and then once again, make sure you read the label. And always when using herbicides, make sure that you wear the proper PPE, uh, gloves, uh, long sleeves, pants, um, maybe even a respirator. Um, make sure that uh, you are protecting yourself fr from those herbicides. And then uh, wanna make sure that any flashback potential uh, you're aware that some some plants are more susceptible than others, and once again, you know some of those more uh, more harmful herbicides. And then <clears throat> you want to make sure that uh, the cost is what you want to is is where you want to be. So these herbicides are all different different uh, uh, prices. Uh, there's the cheapest that I can think of, anyways, is, is glyphosate, um, whereas you get into some more pricey uh, herbicides as you as you kind of uh, go along. Garlon, I think, is, is probably three or four times the, the price of, of Roundup. Here's the uh, uh, PPE that you should wear, once again. Gloves, goggles, respirator, uh, pants over boots. Uh, and then uh, maybe as far as the timing goes, there are other resources that you can use. Uh, there's phenology, phenology chart, and it's for northeastern Illinois. Um, but uh, this is I kind of got an example of what a phenology chart looks like. Um, what this does is it's it's kind of got these colored bars that talk about different methods, different techniques, uh, and when to use them. So it's really difficult to uh, to see. But uh, what this is is on the the left side of the graph is is the uh, plant names. The top is month, you know, May or July through December. And then what these bars signify is the best time to do which management. So once I can go back to that, that uh, website if anybody wants to copy that down. But once again, this is a, a website that has a, a phenology chart for uh, northeastern Illinois. And this, uh, these uh, PowerPoints will be posted on to the Tri-State uh, website as well. So if you don't get it here. <clears throat> a couple other resources, uh, the National Pesticide Information Center, um, the University of Illinois Extension, and Penn State Extension. And, you know, these, once again, just make sure that you, you understand what you're, what you're using before you use it. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I think that uh, I've never, I haven't personally uh, noticed that happening. But uh, as far as the the glyphosate glyphosate goes, the flashback potential is there, but it's low. So um, I would say if they're, you know, if uh, especially with foliar application, I mean, you need to worry about vaporization. Um, if it get, but I guess the vaporization level of glyphosate is somewhere in the north of 90 degrees. So it has to be or maybe 88 degrees, something like that. So it has to be pretty warm for that to evaporate. So if you've already uh, if you've already cut it, my suggestion would be to uh, uh, come back in the spring after it's resprouted, and you can do a foliar application. And the reason being is it's it's a, it'll be easier. You don't have to go back and recut, uh, and then it'll you know kind of get it all. Uh, I have seen it uh, uh, re-sprout, so I mean, I mean, it's ironwood comes in pretty readily. So I mean, I I've always treated it, um, it but I you know the, I've seen other people cut it flush and it doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, coppice very easily. But I mean, to get rid of it, I'd treat it. All right, thank you. <laughs>